Hi everyone, uh, welcome. It is Thursday. We're back on normal schedule. Um, so welcome to everyone that is online live. Um, for those of you that are watching later, no worries. But um, for those of you that are online live, then please make this as interactive as you want as a session. So we're going to spend the next hour uh, going through your images, not mine, uh, in Capture One. We're going to edit um, most of them to, to fix any issues that you sent in, but also see what we can uh, change about the images. For those of you that don't know what Capture One is, it's that thing. Um, so that logo there is the logo for the software. It's a raw processor, so it takes the images that are taken from your camera, the raw content, and it allows us to process them, much like, a, I guess, you know, it used to be dark rooms with film and so on, um, but we can make changes to that raw data to hopefully enhance the photos, um, but sometimes things go too far, and we're going to spend some time correcting them um, in this session. So for all of you that are online, just please bear in mind that what I'm saying right now, like bang, you're not seeing for another seven or eight seconds. So by the time you write a comment in, there's going to be a bit of a delay before it looks like I'm responding. That's not me being rude. It's just the way that streaming works. Um, before we go into Capture One itself, let's just remind um, those of you that are using Capture One that the current version is Capture One 21. The version, if you go to your About screen, is 14.3.1. So that little About screen up there. If your Capture One version doesn't say that, if it says version 20, which is actually version 13 um, in, in software terms, you'll be able to follow along just fine. Just make sure you're up to the same uh, or to the latest version of version 20. If you're on version 12 or 11 or 10 or 9 or 8 or hopefully not 7 or beyond, mm -hmm. Um, you're going to struggle with some of the features that we talk about in this session. It's your choice. You can carry on um, with your existing version of software, or you can look at upgrade options on CaptureOne.com. Um, as some of you will know, uh, Capture One 22 is, is being talked about already. In there, um, you'll see there are updates about things like pano stitching and HDR merge. So these are things that um, a few people have wanted. Um, Depending on which side of the, the fence you sit on, they're either going to be priceless tools that you're desperate to get hold of or ones that you're not too fussed about. That's your choice. But for anyone looking at Capture One at the moment, there are certain offers that are going on. For instance, if you buy version 21, you get version 22 for free. Um, but your call uh, on what you want to do. For those of you that don't have Capture One at all, then go to CaptureOne.com, download a free trial, um, and have a little play with it. So without much further ado... Apart from Jim's point, let me just move you down here, Jim, so we can read it. Um, I think I started with Capture One Four. I don't, I don't know what point I started using it, but it was something. Early. It was certainly um, around that time. But um, yeah, a lot has changed since then. So let's get into our Capture One session itself. Uh, let's load up the software. So here is our standard uh, Capture One version uh, twenty one interface. So in here, we've got obviously our, uh, our viewer in the middle, so the main viewer for any pictures, browser on the right-hand side, um, a load of tool tabs on the left, and a load of information at the bottom. If you don't know how this or this setup actually all works, please go to the Capture One Learning Hub, so support.captureone.com, and it will explain all the things like, for instance, if you wanted to change um, the position of the browser to have it below, have the tools on the right-hand side, etc., etc. You can do all that. Um, it's one of the most um, configurable layouts out there uh, for photo editing, but please, please you know, get your Capture One set up for you the way that you want it. Right, so this shot from Chris. Uh, Chris has actually sent in two images, and we're going to start with this one because I think it's an easy um, answer. And then we're going to go on to a slightly more complicated one. Um, to Jehu, uh, Capture One 22 is coming soon, yes. Um, I actually genuinely, I don't know exactly when it's coming um, in terms of date terms, but yes, Capture One 22 is on the way um, and some of the features, well, as I mentioned, are already uh, being announced as to things that are going to come in that version. So Chris's question uh, on this particular shot was about noise. Um, and let's just, so the first thing I'm going to do is just remove the before and after, but if I wanted to see before and after, we've got our slider here. Um, click up there. If you don't see this button at the top, you can press the Y button on your keyboard, which will display and un or not display it. If you don't want this slidey thing, if you just want before and after to be a complete um, before slash after, then I can do it that way by holding down up here and changing it from split to full. Um, but effectively, this is giving me a view of 
once I've included all the edits that have been made, and these are Chris's edits already, versus almost the raw. And what I mean by almost the raw is the before will still have certain aspects of the base processing loaded into it. And as you can see here on the right hand side, this is, I guess, let's call it a heavy crop. There is a heavy crop on this shot. It's been rotated quite significantly and it's been cut down in size. Now, obviously, if I was to do a before and after with the without crop to with crop, I don't even know how that would work, but it'd be confusing. So the before and after is factoring in keystone crop and so on before to after so that you can compare, but it's not factoring in any of the edits that you've made in the before shot. So question about noise. In other words, can we get rid of any more noise? Um, especially Chris has talked about in the shadows. So let's have a look. And the first thing I'd say is there's not that much noise there. So my, my gut feel is to actually say no, because you've done a pretty good job as it is. Um, there's a denoise layer here that Chris has sent in. Um, this layer, if I go to the uh, details tab, you'll see in here there's a noise reduction amount in there. Um, that, if I turn this layer off, so we can see, I don't know whether this is going to come out on YouTube, but hopefully if I zoom in, you'll be able to see it. Remember noise never ever judge an image on noise based on anything less than 100% viewing on the screen. So if you're at 100%, great, or more, great. If you're zoomed out further, then you're not seeing a real representation of that noise. So whenever you're trying to do a noise tweak or a reduction, please, please make sure that you're in the very, very, very zoomed in mode, 100% or more, to make sure that we're uh, we're on the same page. Okay, um, Benigo Plans uh, asks, we'll catch you on 22 available for free upgrade. Um, so, no, because it's not free. You're paying for it. <laughs> that's, that's the subscription. So, yes, you will get version 22 on subscription. So, Capture One has two um, licensing models. One model is a perpetual license. So, you buy a license, and that license allows you to use that major version. So, version 20, version 21, or version 22, or whatever, for as long as you want to, and as long as your computer can continue to do so. At a certain point, Capture One will stop developing that version and they'll move on to the next major version. So if you buy a perpetual license, if you start at 20.0, you get 20.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 whatever. The second it switches to 21, you've got to pay to upgrade. That's the way the perpetual licenses work. If you're on a subscription, you can choose which version you want to use. So you can choose to move up to 22 or you can choose to stay at 21. It doesn't matter, but the current version is always available to you. But I do want to be clear, it's not a free upgrade. It's paid for, you're paying for it. That's what your subscription is. I find this quite a lot with a lot of software companies. They, we've managed somehow to fall into this idea of everything being, you know, it's a free upgrade. It's not, you're, that's what you're subscribing to. You've paid for it, so use it. Um, but yes, if you're on subscription, you will have access to version 22. And if you continue, presumably it will be version 23, but whatever else um, you choose. Okay, so noise in here. Um, without this on, we get a bit of noise. With this on, the noise is refined. It's, do it's done a good job in general in, in Capture One. So if I come out to 100%, I don't see much noise. There's a little bit in here but we're at 536% at this point. If I come out again, let's go to you know, even 200%, it's still pretty clean. Um, so my gut feel, Chris, is no, there's not much more we can do because if we start increasing the noise reduction, we're gonna start losing detail. Noise reduction effectively is blurry. That's, that's, that's the effect that it has on the picture. And you've got this nice and crisp. Um, even at 2.8, um, you know, it's an ultra wide lens at 17 mil, but it's a very, very crisp image. It, it looks good. You know, I wouldn't change how much noise reduction you've done because if you do more, you're going to lose some detail in there. Uh, we can prove it. So we're at 55 at the moment. If I start increasing up to, let's say, 100, we start to see it blurs a little bit because that's what it's designed to do. Um, so you, you end up losing more than you gain uh, by trying to push it too far. At the end of the day, this was shot at ISO 400. There's a bit of noise in that. 
um, very very low light so you know your shadows and let's just look at the before and after the shadows have been lifted so when we lift a shadow we tend to bring noise with it the result of that is I'm expecting some noise but I would say in this shot there's actually a lot less than I would expect to see um, from other cameras which is good one thing I would consider doing is up here especially you see on the edit we've gone to a little bit of a green sort of tint up here and it's with the white balance change that's happened it's with the lifting of some of the colors um, and certainly out in the shadows so out here I'm, I'm kind of preferring this original tone to the new one personally um, so I'm tempted and it's again it's your choice I've made a, a copy of this one a clone of it um, I would be tempted certainly let's just pull up our sky layer which is up here um, just to pull that white balance back down again to a little bit bluer and away from this green area here just to um, let's just look at these two here so you see the one on the right now is a little bit um, cooler um, and slightly less green just from making that change there um, if I were to take out the sky layer we'd see we get some of these highlights back so this this reduction in clarity I, I get it um, but it's meaning that you're losing some of these little highlights off the clouds um, and re or reducing some of the structure as well so personally I'd pull them back up a little bit just to get it uh, get it back to more more crisp details in the sky I don't think you need to blur that sky out um, Paul has just said uh or are we two by one crop potentially um so if we were to switch this crop um so crop tool up here to change the aspect ratio of your crop obviously if you're on a unconstrained crop you can just you know to go to your heart's content um or you can hold down the shift button when it's unconstrained and it will keep the aspect ratio to whatever you chose if you want a set aspect ratio you can right click anywhere in the crop or you can hold down on the crop tool and you can choose some of the standard ones that are there if a ratio that you want isn't there add it you can add your own aspect ratios you can add 127 by 16 if you want it doesn't matter capture one will add it to this list and then you can uh, use it to your heart's content so in paula's um point a two by one crop let's have a little look because there's quite a dramatic um shift across here so if we went to even there I'm tempted not to start something at the edge of a frame. Um, some of you know that <laughs> that's one of my pet peeves. Um, but let's just have a look at what that does to the shot. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I like this texture down here at the bottom. Um, we lose some of that with a two by one. But yeah, I mean, it, it works um, as far as shots go. That, that's nothing wrong with that prop. But um, I'm also not particularly fussed if that one's the, the preference. So noise, you know, can you get it better? On this particular case, I don't think you can. You could make it completely noise free with whacking up those tools to their the highest values. The trade off you're going to have is losing detail in the process of doing it. Um, just one thing I've just noticed. I'm going to just go to a new variant rather than a clone variant. So a clone variant takes all of the changes we've made in this version of the image. Remember, I've, at the moment, I've got four different versions of the image. There's still only one raw file. These are just versions and, and variants, hence it's called that, with a list of edits in. So if I clone the variant, it takes all the edits and it creates a new version of it or a new variant of it. If I go to a new variant, it creates one from the raw, so a fresh version of the shot out of camera. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm guessing, Chris, this wasn't on a tripod. Um, but I just want to look at something because there is a line um in this shot here you see this line that comes out and especially when i go to the crop there's like a dark line and i th i know what it is it's a gradient isn't it so be careful with this when you add a gradient on the shot if you've got something like a mountain projecting through that gradient like in this case up here you see this dark line unfortunately it's going to go straight through the mountain so that does limit us of course it wasn't there in the first place but it does limit to what we can do now the reason that's important in my head is there is an argument to go wider on the crop so yes we want to straighten up the shot but i wonder i mean this isn't particularly great down here 
but I wonder whether that's not slightly more impressive. Now, this mask here isn't actually from the sky layer. I'm guessing it's one of the cloud layers. Let's have a look. No, bottom grow. Oh, it's the bottom to lighten. Ah, so it's the reverse. So actually what Chris has done is added a gradient on the bottom that lightens up the bottom rather than darkening the sky. So I'm just going to then use my eraser. Uh, relative, oh no, we need to keep it small. I'll show you why. 100% um, flow, not auto mask. And I'm going to rasterize. So when I go to edit a, sorry, I need to paint, don't I? When I go to edit a gradient layer, we can't edit the gradient. Um, with like a paintbrush, we have to rasterize it first into pixels, and then it means that what I type in um, is going to be done as if I were painting over it rather than if I was editing a, a gradient and stretching it and changing the angle. So it becomes like a pixel editor. And I'm just going to paint and include this mountain. Now, normally we try and use something like Magic Brush, but my guess is these tones are going to be too near to each other. So I'm just going to see if we can get away very quickly because I don't want to spend too much time on the one shot, especially since the question was only noise. <laughs> um, but let's just erase a little bit out of here. And yeah, we might need to go for a harder edge just to get that crisp snow line back in. That's Good there. In fact, I need to add, actually, we're, we're probably going the wrong way. Let's just add a bit of a harder edged brush across that snow line. There we go. Right. Now, with that done, and let me just fix that bit there. Uh, uh, sorry. Let's just because I made a mistake in there, it seems. We just need to remove that out of the, the mask. Uh, we're going to get into a bit of a loop, which isn't good, but let's just see. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Right, we're going to undo some steps. So, undoing. <laughs> um, to Ruben, your point, use Luma. Not really. The problem being, if I take this layer off, these Lumas are the same. This is the same range of brightness. So what you're seeing at the moment is the after mask change, um, where, where you can see a difference between the foreground and the background. Without the mask on, which is what Luma is relying on, this sky is the same as this mountain, and even Magic Brush isn't going to get that. So what I need to do is just undo quite a few steps to undo my mistake of painting in there. And in fact, it was only the last click that I did by the look of it. So let's just get back to where we were. So the undo steps, just remember, is across the whole of Capture One up here. You can undo an individual tool, but the undo and redo steps are across the entire um, image and, and actually collection. So even if I, for instance, delete that image, press the delete key, if I go to undo, it doesn't undo the last thing I did to an image. It actually undoes the deletion that I did. It's every single thing that I do in Capture One is controlled by that undo button. But essentially, we'll fix that in a second. But I'm just looking at whether or not this is a better crop maybe than there. I don't know. Down here, we could, if we really wanted to, try and heal. <laughs> Let's give it a go. Um, try and heal this rock and take some extra snow. Let's see what Capture One does. Ah, of course, it tries to heal outside of where we were looking, which is a little bit annoying. So when it does this, unfortunately, in current um, Capture One, what we have to do is change our crop, go back to our healing tool, and choose from somewhere within the crop, like this, and hope it does a bit better job than that. That's a bit better. Then go back to my crop tool and get to there. Now, personally, I find that really annoying. The fact that it, the second it uses an area to, to heal outside of your crop, you have to do all that, um, that wiggling around to get it back inside. Um, hopefully, that's something that's going to be worked on. But for now, that's the way that we do it. Right. Up here is this green stuff that I'm not a fan of. So I'm just going to create a quick new layer. 
100% opacity, quite a big layer, very, very soft brush. And I'm just going to go along here and just turn that mask on so I can see what we're painting. And with that mask, I'm going to go into our color editor, choose our greens and shift them to be a bit more blue, but also take their saturation down. And let's just choose this color in here. It's probably in the oh purpley, really. I think it's a bit more cyan than that, but let's have a little look um, out here. Well, it still convinces purple. Okay, we'll go with it. Um, but let's shift that to be a bit more blue. Let's shift our cyans because I'm pretty sure that it is there. Um, and saturation down and our yellows, we're going to shift to be a bit more red rather than green. So this layer, effectively, is just taking some of the green out. It's very, very slight, but it's taking some of that green away um, from that, that toning up there. Um, right, where are we? Joe, I'd reduce the brightness on the foreground layer to counterbalance the background. Yeah, I, it's funny. When we remove that, um, that gradient, you see how much of a difference you've got between the foreground and the background. I don't know whether I'd remove it completely, but I just wonder whether what we could do is sort of blend in um, from this bottom. So I'd, I'd almost be tempted to new layer, new layer it, um, bring in a new gradient there and just with that gradient softly bring that in there. It would make sense we've got some light out here. It doesn't quite make sense that all of this is quite so bright in the foreground. And I think that's Joe's point. Um, so we've just got to be careful there. Um, now here, I want this gradient to happen here. So this is the 100% mark, 50% mark, and 0% mark. With the gradient mask, if I hold down the Option key, or the Alt key on Windows, and then grab this side here, it moves it asymmetrically. So we can have a fall off where it goes 100 to 0, or sorry, 100 to 50, quite slowly, and then 50 to 0, really quick. Um, and in this case, that's going to be quite handy because it means we can have a nice drop off before it hits the end of the mountain. And this is more subtle. Um, but yeah, maybe that's a better, uh, a slightly better way rather than having this big glow in the foreground. Um, but that's, yeah, personal choice. Uh, Paula, am I suggesting the heel outside the crop behavior will change in the next version? I'm not suggesting it will. I'm suggesting it needs to. Um, because it's getting really annoying. So effectively, I know a few people have, have been talking about this for a while. I, I, even I, I, I've noticed it more and more. Um, the second we start to, to heal um, or, or clone outside of the area of the crop, it's a bit annoying, like you just saw. You have to move the crop, grab the source point back in, and then move it back. I hope that in a, an upcoming version it's fixed, but I, I don't know um, whether that's on the list. Right, um, Francois, you're, you're allowed to be late, that's okay. Um, but he made it, cool. So uh, to Ruben, yeah, or reduce the opacity. Yeah, we, we could do on that main layer, but the opacity reduction, uh, where were we, bottom gradient, the problem is that that's going to be across the entire gradient. Um, so if I go to this layer and then pull this down here, we also affect out here as well as in here, and I think Chris wanted to keep the shadows. So, you know, we might reduce it a little bit, but by having another layer on top that's sort of a, a reversal of it, but over a, a, a slight, uh, I guess, um, slope across there, then then maybe that's going to uh, be a bit more natural. But yeah, it's a, this is a tough one um, because we need to keep it realistic. Um, and if you're shooting into the sun, it's likely that these shadows would be dark. Uh, but if you want to see the detail, then yes, we've got to do some lifting. Okay, um, let's just have a look at this second shot. So this is also Chris's shot. Um, so before we start with this, I, I didn't understand. Um, Chris uh, made a point um, in, in the, the images that he sent in, he or she, I'm not sure actually, um, about the fact that there was a, uh, I guess, a mistaken uh, long exposure. And what I was looking at is... Out here, we've got a bit of blurriness in there. I, I get that. If I go to the original, we can see there's been some, um, whether it's camera shake, whether it was, it was, I doubt it was handheld for five seconds, but you know, maybe it was wind. It could have been. Um, but then yeah, the sailing boat may have been moving if it was windy. Hmm. Um, but either way, 
one of the ways to fix some of this stuff, of course, is to put in some sharpening and some um, structure and some clarity and so on. But here's the weird bit. It's the bit I don't understand. On our water layer here, we've tried to clean out um, some of this this rippling in the water and, and effectively blur it using clarity and structure way, way down. Um, and that, that water effectively is um, smoothed by the fact that we've removed clarity out of the scene. So clarity adds uh, some nice uh, detail, let's call it, and contrast, but in the mid-tones. So it tends to add in sort of texture and stuff like that into areas where there's a little bit of contrast between them. If you use negative clarity, then what you get is this softening effect. So that's without this, this layer, this negative clarity layer, and that's with. But the problem is this layer goes across some of this barrier. So what we end up with, unfortunately, is a barrier that was kind of sharp, ending up quite blurry. So let's just have a little look up here. Where the mask isn't defined very well, we've got what was the sharp edge, all of a sudden getting a little bit, well, a little bit messy. So there's two things with this. Number one, I don't think negative clarity works here because you've still got texture in the water. So it's not like it was an ultra long exposure and we're trying to really smooth it out. It wasn't really there to start with that, that long exposure feeling. So adding negative clarity, all it's going to do is just sort of wipe out some of the detail, but not give you the blurry effect that you wanted. In this case here for this shot, to get the real blur, you, you're talking about needing a longer exposure, you know, 30th, or well, sorry, 30th of a second, 30 seconds or more. Um, my guess is at F20 and ISO 100, they are my normal telltale signs that someone hasn't got either a filter or a strong enough filter to be able to do the exposure they wanted. So they've pushed the lens to its, well, in theory, um, one of the minimum apertures, maybe it goes to 22. And also then reduce the ISO to try and get as long an exposure as possible. The problem with doing that, at f20 you're likely to introduce diffraction. So if I go to our lens profile area in here, one thing we don't have enabled is diffraction correction. That will help, not fix, but help some of the sharpness issues. Because some of this sharpness is coming from diffraction. So if I turn this off, take a look here at this tree and these branches here. And let's turn it on. You see these sharpen right up. Now, that's not a compensation for using a wider aperture to get rid of diffraction. In an ideal world, this wouldn't be shot at f20. But it does help fix scenarios where something like this has gone wrong um, or something has, has ended up not as clean and sharp as you'd want it to be in an ideal world. So if ever you're shooting at roughly, whether it's you know f8, f11, generally okay, anything more than f11 or a smaller aperture than f11 just have a look at the detail areas on the shot and if it doesn't look particularly sharp tick that diffraction correction box see if it helps if it doesn't help turn it off again with all the tools in capture one if it's not helping it's risking your image so just be really careful um but yeah so to me Let's have a little look at what we can effectively undo because I'm, I'm genuinely in the place where I don't think this um, unclar or declarity version uh, is helping. If I reset this tool on this layer, so we're on the water layer, um, the clarity tool here, let's just reset this tool in isolation. We get back all our detail. And I'm in a place where I think that's more valuable than having this sort of blurring effect but not really and losing some of the detail on the edges of course i can go in here if if my only issue was the edges of here well i can go to my eraser let's just turn these off uh 100 opacity and let's just erase around here and we get our sharp sort of breakwater back again great but even with that We've then got, well, actually, we've got two problems. Number one, there's now a very big disparity between how sharp this breakwater is and how blurry, and it's not the same as long exposure blur, it's just blur. Um, the outside is, I'll just do the same on that boat out there, but I'd have to do along here. 
And unless I'm going to be really, really, really accurate, I'm going to clip some of the uh, water. And it's just not going to look neat. So I can fix it ish, but we don't really want ish. Uh, we want to be a bit more purposeful than that. So my temptation, and actually we're going to do it, is to turn that layer off. Um, let's leave the sharpness that we've got. If we're on F20 and we're in a difficult and challenging scenario like this where it's a five second uh, exposure with a bit of movement from something, the last thing I want to do is reduce detail. And I know the temptation is to try and make that water smooth. Sometimes you've got to make the best of, of the tools that you've got um, and the shot that you have. So ideally, yes, if, if you wanted this to be an ultra long exposure, an ND1000 on top of that at F11, you'd have probably ended up with a smoother, cleaner water. You'd have to think about what that does to the clouds. Someone else mentioned, where are we? Uh, Ruben, there. If the clouds are moving, long exposure could be messy on the mountains, um, the sun reflection. The sun reflection, not so much. You'd get a blend. So as that, that sun reflection changes, uh, it goes brighter and darker and brighter and darker. Throughout your exposure, you're going to see um, a bit of softening around these edges here. But the clouds themselves, yes, you would lose their structure. Um, so it'd be a bit of a, a bit of a, I guess, bargain um, that you you try and do between trying to work out what's the minimum exposure I can get away with to make the water smoother, but what's the maximum exposure I can get away with before the clouds start turning um, a bit too soupy and, and we lose all the texture. So, to me, it's a case of we've got this this is this is the shot as is i wouldn't try and make it into something else it it's a bit like saying well you know I'd, um I'm trying to think of an example i wasn't there at um oh, wrong one i wanted to clone that variant uh it's a bit like saying i wasn't there at night time so oops don't do that on water that's too on the background wasn't there at night time so we're gonna change Ooh, that's a bit weird that it's only affecting there. Why is that? That's something very strange. We're on the background layer. Hmm. Oh, because we've got a custom base layer on top. Okay. I confused myself there for a second. But, you know, I wasn't there at night, so we're going we're gonna to do that and pretend that it was at night. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a night shot. It doesn't make sense that we're trying to make it into something that it wasn't. And in the same case, I'd be in a place of this was not a long exposure shot of, of any stretch so don't try and push it too far on the clouds themselves well we could at the moment chris has got an existing layer up here and this sky layer does a little bit of desaturation a um, bit of reducing highlights to get some details back in the cloud i get that a bit of clarity and so on ironically in this one i'd push the clarity a bit further on these clouds you know you've got some good structure in there so let's use it we can push our structure so clarity think big um, areas so areas of detail structure think tiny areas textures lines and all that sort of stuff we could try dehaze which is going to give you a little bit more definition just be careful you don't overdo it but what's happening there is we get all of this stuff back um, let's just temporarily undo dehaze so here it's it's there and it's visible but it's a lot more textured and detailed here but again you see this line and it's a similar thing to the previous shot it's where this mask ends, and it ends very abruptly. So uh, just be careful with masking. This mask does not match the cloud line. So if you're going to do masking, make sure that you're really, really accurate with it. Um, this is a gradient layer that's been um, that's been used on, on the, the, well, the overall sky. Um, it's going to ask me, do I want to rasterize it the second I go to paint? Yes, I do. Um, and I'm just going to add in, with a very, very soft-edged brush, um, some extra bits. So I had to rasterize that layer first, remember, in order to be able to draw on our gradient mask. But this allows me to draw a lot more accurately and to make sure we are over all those clouds. Um, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago we've people have really got to get on masks in general um if if you're going to mask the sky mask the sky the fact that the mask or the the radial mask sorry radio mask the gradient mask is only available with a straight edge means you've got to do something else it doesn't mean you just stop with the gray or the straight edge 
Otherwise, you get effects like that where you can see the mask has, um, has finished before the sky had. And also up here, you can see with this sky layer, this bit actually gets a lot, lot darker. So I would be tempted with our eraser. I'm going to put the uh, flow up and opacity quite a way down. And I'm just going to erase some of this stuff in here to give these clouds a bit more uplift um, in there. Weird straight line, if anyone noticed that. Um, some strange things going on in Capture One today. Anyway, so I'd fix that line in the sky, in the clouds. I wouldn't use negative clarity in this shot to try and blur the water. Um, I would be tempted to just leave that as is at this point. The other edits that Chris has done, I think, are good. You know, enriching the foliage. There's a whole green layer, I think, I saw on here, um, here, which is this layer up here. Strangely, it also grabs up here. I'm not sure why. Uh, it may be that the Luma range is grabbing it as well. So what I would do is just erase this part of the cloud up here because we don't really want an auto mask on there. We don't really want this stuff being affected by it. Hmm. For some reason, we can't erase. Gremlins, weird. But just be careful that we're not using Luma ranges and we're not using gradient masks just to reduce the amount of work we're going to put in. Yes, they help, but think about what you were trying to do. If the gradient mask gets you some way there, then great, it saved you some time, but that's not the job done. And, and this is an example here. Look at this mask here. It's not necessarily quite lining up with where all the green stuff is. Um, and Luma ranges and gradient masks help, but... You may have to go in afterwards and do some, let's call it manual um, improvements um, beyond what's already there. Um, ah, it's the weird Luma range thing. We've seen this a couple of times. For some reason, on a certain versions that are submitted into version 21, when we go to edit a Luma range, it doesn't let us. A bit strange. There's a couple of gremlins, as I say, in, in this version, but I'm not sure what's going on with that. But that's it, Chris. Yeah, I, the, the long exposure, or the faux long exposure, as you called it, I think part of that can be fixed with your diffraction correction. So use diffraction correction when you're using a small aperture, if it makes a difference. I wouldn't try and fake um, a long exposure using clarity and structure. It, it just doesn't look realistic. And unfortunately, if your masking isn't spot on, you're going to clip other objects that then just look weird. And if you are, you know, I said it, but if you're going to mask the sky, mask the sky. Don't just rely on the gradient getting it right. Very few skies finish exactly in a perfect line uh, with nothing, no clouds, no colors or whatever spilling over. So make sure the masks match the image, not just the tool that you're using. All right. Uh, Gilles shot. Now, I don't think Gilles is online, but I had a question about this shot and it's probably... Um, not one that I'm going to get answered while we're here, but I got four variants sent in and I'm not sure whether the one with a green, um, flag and five stars is the favorite or whether it's this one, which is the last of the variants in a row. The reason I say that is because I prefer the last one, not the, uh, not the gradient or not the uh, variant that's got the five stars. And there's a reason for that, and it's very specifically around this sun. And it's something to just be really careful of in terms of our eye's perception on an image. So to compare, I'm going to load up these two images side by side. And let's just have a look at our sun area. Now I'm hoping that this comes out on your video feed. But hopefully you can all see, this one feels like a solid color. Um, we get a sunburst here, and then it slowly fades out into the same color, but just darker and darker shades. This version here, we have white in the middle, we have a yellow ring around here, and then we have a red ring around here, and then we have a dull ring further out. So I've got effectively a color change that's uncomfortable to me. If, if this image works in a way that it's designed to be effectively monotone, not the same as black and white, but with only one predominant tone. It doesn't really work if we're introducing color <laughs> into the sun. 
And I was trying to work out what's causing it and whether it was a layer. And funnily enough, it's actually back to the original background. Um, and it's our curve. So if I look at, we're using the ICC profile is generic and generic. So there's no um, pro standard profile for this Olympus camera. But the difference is one is linear response and one is auto. We'll quite often talk about using linear response when you've got a very high contrast image. The reason being because unlike the auto curve, which will put a bit of a contrasty S curve into the shot, so it brightens the highlights, darkens the shadows, the linear response curve is more realistic to the raw data. So it, it tends to be a bit more accurate in terms of 10 equals 10, 20 equals 20. It's not doing any manipulation. So just out of interest, I picked up this shot and let's just create two different variants. So these are the same, exact same uh, variant, the one that's ooh, behind my head. So that one there and that one there, these are copies of variant four. On this one, I'm going to change this curve to be linear response and look what happens. So these are identical. Their, their edits are exactly the same. They are literally cloned copies. They're cloned variants from variant number four. The only difference between these two is the linear response curve on the left and the auto curve on the right. So you could argue, and I know we had this discussion when uh, Pro Standard was launched, you could argue that the linear response curve is more accurate to reality. Maybe this is what reality looked like on the left-hand side. All I know is, aesthetically, I think I prefer the one on the right. Now, I may be in a minority slash majority of one with that view. I don't know... Well, I don't know where people's preference lies, but from a print point of view, this one just feels a whole lot more... Um, comfortable and, and finished than this one which looks like it needs something to do to fix that sunshine to my eye so even though this version here may be Shields preference what I am going to do is switch this linear response back to auto which by the way is actually film standard so whether you go auto or whether you go film standard it's pretty much the same thing um, but let's go to the auto curve in fact let's just clone this first and I'm going to color it a different color. So we're going to color it red. And I'm just going to move it up. So we've got the original from Gilles. And my version, which will have its auto curve loaded in. So we've got back to more contrast. Yep, for sure. So if I look at this one, we've got a bit more subtlety down here because it's linear response. But what I can also do, remember, with an auto curve, even on the background layer, is pull back our highlights a bit more. I could pull back some white a little bit, which is the very, very top end of our highlights. We could pull our shadows up a little bit to soften that transition between what's illuminated and what's not, which gets you closer. So effectively, if I use our HDR tools, it can get us closer to the linear response output, but it doesn't necessarily do quite the same as linear response. It doesn't protect some of those highlights and, and shadows themselves out of the camera. To me, again, this has got a bit of a green tint. I'm not sure whether the I mean, this bridge has, I think, some green on it. But even these areas down here on this concrete, um, it's not quite... I mean, yes, I'm expecting to see a red shift, a red bias because of the light. But it's not quite neutral to my eye. So all I'm going to do is just shift that tint a little bit to the right. And maybe we go a little bit warmer. So we get to there, I'd actually be tempted and, and we didn't, wouldn't normally do it because we buy lenses that don't do this, but just to vignette this slightly. So just to take off some of the heat from the corners of the shot. Um, and in fact, just looking at this down here, I want to push that tint a bit more. Probably go to about there. That feels, it just, uh, again, this is personal preference, but that feels a bit better. Um, there is a radial curve in here, sorry, radial curve, a radial mask in here, which has darkened the brightness. Probably a good idea. If I take this off, you'll see why. Um, it just means that we're focusing all the bright and light into where the sun is. There's a pop layer, as, uh, as Jules called it, which is effectively pulling back the highlights, but also shifting the levels. So what that does is it brings anything that was 240, so not very, well, bright, but not the brightest, 
and it makes it 255. If we were to undo this, you'll see that the whole image becomes a little bit duller. There, we get that pop, as he's, as he's called it. Good, good shout. Um, and then I'm not, oh, this is the, uh, there's a lens flare, sorry. Let's go back to the original. There's a lens flare in here. Um, so using the clone tool, not the heel tool, perfectly fine. Um, you can do there, um, and it gets rid of it. So there's what was um, the five-star version um, from Gilles, and there's the version that I would end up with. And the key thing, again, going back to that point, there's nothing wrong with the edits that Gilles made. In fact, you'll see I've, I've hardly changed them. But this sun here, um, let's just zoom out there, with these coloured stripes, let's call it, I, um, I'm not a fan of that look personally, so I would switch back to the auto curve. Use HDR if you need to as tools to bring back some of the detail, to bring back the shadows, to, to tone down the highlights, and you'll get to arguably a slightly more subtle place um, with sun flares than what you would with linear response. Linear response is great if you've got a very high contrast image and need to recover the highlights and the shadows and can't do it with the auto curve or the film standard curve. Um, but there are some risks to it, and one of them is this color thing. I have also seen this, and we talked about it a few months back, but I've seen this with the pro standard profiles. It may be, and this is the fun one, maybe actually that's what's really there on the left with the sun. Maybe the pro standard profiles are correct. Maybe linear response is correct. That is what the sun does at sunset. But it doesn't look very nice um, in my mind. And I'm used to seeing them like that on the right. So I'm going to stick with that way for, for the time being. Um, we're about, I agree the linear response curve is messy. To be honest, it's about coming at the same thing from two different angles. So if you take auto, quite often you've got to recover some shadows, bring back some highlights because it's pushed some things off the histogram effectively. If you start with linear response, you've typically got to add contrast um, in order to get that punch back. So neither of them are ideal in, in some situations, but in the situation where you've got a sun flare, yeah, I, I would stick to the auto curve um, and it'll, it'll help you. I've also seen, actually, thinking about it, um, on cityscapes, um, the pinwheels that come out of streetlights and so on, with a linear response curve, they are so flat. They don't look like they're illuminated lights. They, they can be very flattened. Um, and the, the star that comes out can, can look a bit messy. Um, whereas with the auto curve, it tends to give them that punch back. Um, Pascal's the same. So auto curve looks a lot better, um, whether realistic or not. That's the thing. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly um, whether my eyes are lying to me. But to me, that feels like a nicer sunset than... Uh, than the one with the weird rings. Um, so, there we go. There's Gilles' shot. Next up, Joe. Um, there's a good point from Joe, actually, on this. Um, when we... <laughs> sorry, I've just seen Van's point. Yes, please do. Please send a, a complaint up to the owners of the sun um, for inconsiderateness. Is that even a word? Inconsideration? Whatever. Either way. Um, right, so... We, we got, it's just, where are we, three people in? Oh, not bad. Um, so Joe's um, image that was sent in um, referenced the fact that they're quite happy with it out of camera. Um, and it was actually quite refreshing because this is the thing. If you're happy with that out of the camera and, and didn't want to make many changes, then then don't. You don't, it's a funny thing. It's that whole just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, if you've got a shot that you're happy with, you don't have to change it. So please don't. If, if you've got the raw file and look at it and go, that's exactly what I saw. I, that, that reminds me of what I what I viewed. Um, and I'm happy with that out of the camera. Then great, stick with it, please. Um, I wish more did. But the flip side is, if there are things that you want to try and tweak, then you've got the tools to do it. So this shot out of camera. Um, well, in fact, no, this is actually with Joe's edit. So I'm just going to do a before and after and you'll see how subtle the edits are. So there's before, there's after. Let's look at what's been done, because there are a few um, layers in here. So on a background layer, blacks have been raised up. We've got, uh, interestingly, we talked about this, I think, last week. Bit of a bit of a tussle here. So we're increasing the brightness of the darkest parts of the histogram to see more detail. 
But then we're using levels to pull down the darkest parts of the histogram to zero. So if it was seven, it was zero. If you think about what that's doing, this value in here, let's imagine I'm a pixel and I've got a value of five. So I'm in the darkest area of the histogram. I then get told by the HDR tool, you need to increase by roughly 12%. Okay. But then I get told by the levels tool, you need to get darker by, I don't know, roughly 15, 20%. So these two tools start to counter each other and we end up with that seesaw effect of chasing the same um, setting. What you might find is actually this has cancelled this out pretty much. But I'll leave it for now. Um, we've got a bit of a contrast pop. You could see that. Um, the trees themselves, well, up here we've got this lowering of contrast here to counter the previous contrast pop. Uh, Greys that are everything out here. Uh, fog, which is everything up here. And actually, this is adding fog. So just to be clear, what Joe's done isn't use dehaze to clarify the scene. They've used dehaze to reduce the clarity of the scene and actually add in some fog. Um, the snow trees, which are a mask out under here, um, I'm not sure actually what's going on with them. Maybe we've got a uh, got a Kelvin change. No, I'm not sure if we've got a. Don't even know what's been. That's odd, isn't it? I don't know what's been edited in the snow trees layer, but we'll see. Um, a random adjustment layer here just to pull down all highlights um, up above. And then a color layer, finally, um, which, yeah, here it has the midtones being cooled down. Now, what I would say, for the perceived change between there and there, all those layers and all those different changes weren't worth it. Um, because what I'm looking at is an image that actually and I, I agree with, with Joe on this, if that was the look you were looking for out of camera, all of those changes and all of those little button presses don't really add anything. We're not increasing clarity. We're, we're, we're actually adding more fog, but then using contrast to reduce it and make it clear again. We're darkening the shadows in levels, but then we're bringing the shadows up using HDR. We're, we're effectively countering. All these tools are doing one thing, and then the next tool or layer does the other. Um, so to me, we end up with something that's a lot of work for not much change in the end. Now, I'm looking at this and thinking we could probably do a couple of other things with it. I'm actually going to create a new variant, so a blank from raw with no changes in it. And my first thing to do with this shot is to play with clarity. Not too much of it, um, so I'm going to create a new filled layer. I'm not going to do it on the background because I want to be able to back it off later using some opacity. But I'm going to pop our clarity. Now, it may be that the intention wasn't to do that, but this is where I'd go with it. Um, I'd also bring in a bit of extra structure. And I'm not worried about doing it across the whole image. But what I'm looking at is in here where that structure is really going to come and play, not overdoing it. So if I do it up to here, horrible. And when we zoom out, you can see that's that's bad. Don't do that. But we can use a little bit of structure just to define these trees a little bit better. So let's just go to maybe 15. And I'll show you without and with. Now that clarity and structure change gets you all of these leaves or pines on the tree a lot more crisp. And we get a bit more contrast built in from that clarity boost too. I'm just going to go to our lens profile. So we don't have a lens profile loaded in for this. It is a 68 millimeter something. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, where are we? I don't even know. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a 68 millimeter something. So Capture One doesn't have a lens profile. That's fine. It's not an issue. We can do chromatic aberration fixing, and we can allow diffraction correction. Now I'm just going to, again, check. So without, with. And in my head, diffraction correction in this one has made it worse. So I'm actually going to turn that off. We don't need it. It's not improving the image, so don't use it. Now, there is a bit, and I, don't get me wrong, people, people are going to start thinking I hate green, but I've got there's a bit of a, a tint to this shot, which I'd rather was more autumnal and slightly more red than it is at the moment which will come and, and change in a second. And we've got these two hot spots up here in the clouds. So 
I'm going to look at two things. The first is this base layer along here. And what I'm going to do is draw a new layer, so a new empty layer, with a nice little gradient up here. So we can see it's affecting here and not up here. I'm going to go into my color editor. I'm going to take these greens and we're going to just warm them a little bit. So towards the yellow, probably increase the saturation and darken. Then we're going to get the yellows. We're going to push them to be a little bit more red. Oh no, go the other way. In fact, we're going to keep the trees, um, the actual the actual green stuff, to be a little bit green and bring the lightness down there. Good. Now with the midtones, I'm going to move away from this green area. I'm going to move the whole lot to be a bit warmer, a bit more over here into the yellows. So that's our foreground. Um, if I turn that off. You can see it's just a bit paler. Turn it on, we're in a good place. I'm then tempted with all of that, so I've, I've made those changes, to actually pull back the whole saturation of the whole image just back a little bit to make it look colder. If we reduce color in the image, it has the effect of making it chilly. So that's where I'm, I'm doing that. The next one is the sky, and actually this mountain up here. So what I'm going to use is a radial layer to really hone in on this mountain. I'm going to create a new layer. In fact, let's make sure we're labeling these. So foreground green. This one was our master filled layer, which is everything covered. I'm going to create a new layer and call it mountains. And with our mountains layer with a radial mask, I'm going to draw a very, very soft mask over all of this middle bit. Now at the moment it's affecting the outside, not the inside. Right click on the layer, invert the mask, or I could have held down the modifier when I was uh, drawing it. And either way, I'm going to get a layer that's now a soft fall off to the mountain area. Mountain area specifically, I'm going to pull down our highlights a little bit. I'm going to pull down the white a little bit, and I'm going to use a lot more clarity just to bring this to the foreground. This cloud up here in the top, hmm, tough one. Let's just try something. I'm going to use the deep sky style brush. So you find that in the style brushes section. If you don't have the style brushes section, right click on any of the area in the toolbar, go to add tool, and then oops, let's just see it so it's on your screen. Oh, I can't, it's just off, it's down down there. Um, the add style brushes in. I don't have to create a new layer for a style brush because it'll automatically do it for me. I'm going to make a nice big layer and actually soften the hardness and with my deep sky brush see what we get mm, to be honest not much of an improvement it's sort of made it a bit murkier well maybe it's okay but i don't like these two patches now um now this is again personal choice absolutely personal choice you can choose to leave these in i'm not going to <laughs> i'm going to go to my healing brush and we're going to make it a little bit bigger and I'm going to heal out these two clouds just so that we don't have hot spots in the top of the shot. It's not because I don't like those, those cloud breaks. I do. Texture in sky is normally great, but they're just so distracting when we start pulling up clarity that we end up getting, I guess, pulled away from the, the main feature of this shot and up towards the sky. Overall, back to my master filled layer, I'm going to just come back with a bit of a vignette, a small vignette, not too much. We don't want to go to that level, but just to there, just to soften out those edges. And we get to here. Now, as you can see, they I've done it by many, many layers. So you can see the, the different progressions of it. We didn't have to. We could have done a lot of that just with one layer. But from there to there, I'm seeing a big change. The original amount of change from there to there is so slight for the amount of effort that's been put in and, and genuinely 10 out of 10 for doing the right things. But I just look at the output and think mm, I'd, I'd want to see a bigger change for that amount of effort. If we don't like this, then all we have to do on these layers is just back them away. So if we think, oh, actually, it's too much, then just pull all these layers down in opacity. We can pull down even deep sky. Um, the heel layer don't pull down because you'll get some weird, um, well, you can see, you'll see the, uh, the these things start to appear again. Um, so disappeared, reappeared. Um, but we get to, let's say there, we could have them into a certain amount. 
but by doing it on, on by doing big changes but then being able to pull them back will probably give you a bit more flexibility later on and then uh, Joe's just said what about a black and white version I had a look at this earlier um, but if I do a conversion across to black and white let's pull down yellow and red I guess for these trees you you can make it work I kind of like the little color pop personally but yeah either one of those kind of works for me um, they're, they're both perfectly fine but it's just about which one you prefer um, as a feel right so that's it for today I think so Joe's mountain it's just one where I look at the output and think that's a lot of effort to go to for a very minor change um, so either don't don't need to put in that much effort you, you could just do it with a couple of little tweaks and try not to counter uh, the same tool um, or go a little bit bigger and then always back away um, later if you don't like it Gilles here just be careful with that linear response curve it can be great it can really help to rescue certain images but if it's if it's used on sunsets and sunrises just be careful with those rings around the sun um, you know don't don't go too far um, trying to fix that without realizing that maybe a switch to the auto curve here might have helped uh, and then we've got Chris's too so this one here if it wasn't a long exposure don't try and make it a long exposure um, you, you're just going to end up wrapping yourself in knots trying to do that and then the mountain one just be careful with some of these these masks but in terms of noise no Chris the amount of noise reduction you did was the right amount it's it's done well um, I wouldn't change that all, all good okay um so reminder again for those of you that weren't there last week um next month so october already um david and i are doing a live um we're going to try and do a live shoot uh from the coastline we'll see how that goes um in the meantime then you are all welcome so join on that facebook group uh, we will talk about if you want to images that we've covered today um, or other stuff either way and that's in between now and next week for next week's session don't forget to upload your files so poreforlive.wetransfer.com um, please include your name no name no edit it's very simple we need to know who you are um, before we uh, before we can edit um, but do upload your images let us know what you are having problems with or what you want us to have a look at and you're welcome of course to upload the EIP file from Capture One which is the one with your edits or upload the RAW and just let us know um, what we need to have a look in between now and next week um, do what you're told according to whatever government you've got to listen to but stay safe everyone and we'll catch you later on cheers bye bye